Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to Humanizing Software episode 65, where the team at Tailwind has the opportunity to talk with a number of global leaders about their perspectives about this unique concept called transformative change, especially as it relates to all things software, but not just software related, but keeping the humans, the human part, the human souls, the important aspect of things as it pertains to all things technology related. We invite you, if you're listening live today, to participate, engage with us, ask questions, provide comments to what our discussion is going to be. And after we finish up, this is going to be living forever on our YouTube channel uh, on humanizing software. And we invite you to also engage with us on Facebook, on X, on used to be Twitter, on any of the various platforms with which we are streaming this live. Check out our previous episodes where we've had the opportunity to talk with folks like Paul O'Brien, Michael Ward, Harsha Balour, Damian, uh, and Ashley Hamilton with Ike Plans, and a number of other folks about their perspective. But today, and I'm going to get right into it because I have a feeling this conversation is going to get a little crazy, a little fast. I have the pleasure and honor of joining with us today, uh, a gentleman that I've had the opportunity to know for about 13 years. We validated that um, in the course of uh, being in the green room before we went live. Uh, but the, the individual joining us today is someone very, very special and near and dear to my heart. Um, I had the opportunity to meet Worley 13 years ago. And Worley is founder and CEO of Strangeworks. He is also an Eisenhower Fellow, a senior member of the IEEE, founder of the Quantum Computing Standards Workshop of the IEEE, an ambassador to CERN and society, and the co-author of Quantum Computing for Babies, we'll get into that, um, and the upcoming Quantum Computing for Dummies books that are coming out here very shortly. We will talk about that in some degree of detail. Prior to starting Strangeworks, he was a managing director at Goldman Sachs. He came to Goldman Sachs with the acquisition of a second startup, Honest Dollar. And prior to Honest Dollar, Worley founded Chaotic Moon Studios, which was acquired by Accenture. So I'm exceptionally excited to have Worley join us in the conversation today. <laughs> well, I'm excited to be here, Andrew. It's good to see you again. Outstanding as well. I know we've got quite a bit of topics to talk about today, including the fact of the <laughs> the first meeting on the Las Vegas Strip back at CES in uh, October, whatever it was, January of 2010, many, 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 many moons ago. But yeah. before we even jump into that, the first and most important thing that we want to make sure that we're having everybody that's listening in now or forever, because we all know digital is forever, Tell us the Worley story. <laughs> okay. Um, you mean like the the origin of why people call me that, which is I hear, passenger's fault? <laughs> I like to I like I mean, to actually here's a, here's keep a condensed, it real. Here's a condensed, here's a condensed version. So um uh was a touring musician, got in a bad accident on Friday the 13th in 1991, uh got laid up for a year ended up using the insurance money to build a digital studio and um, do a bunch of scoring for soundtrack stuff using Macromind Director, which is all the old people remember. And then Apple, after the 89 earthquake, moved all of support and finance and everything to Austin, uh, which a lot of people don't know. So they're building a billion dollar campus, but it's like they've had all those employees here for 30 years. Uh, and so um, they were looking for experts because they were doing product placement in the movies. And so when you saw a screen in a movie, it was done using director because you couldn't film a screen. So it was all faked. And so, you know, I got a job doing phone support at Apple and the rest is history. I ended up running the international training programs and then I went into R&D um, as a test engineer, uh, working with some amazing mentors that I still talk to almost every month at least um and then left ibm in 97 to go to uh, sorry left apple in 97 to go to ibm because the cultures are obviously similar and uh then just get, did like startup big company startup big company start a big company until 2009 in november when i left bmc software and decided you know startups talk a lot of shit about big companies and vice versa and uh, you know they don't have enough rules and they have too many rules and so on and so forth and I came up with my model, which was effectively taking all the good stuff from 
you know, a, a, a large company where there's, you know, some sort of rules and regulations that are just enough to keep things, you know, honest and, and above board and all. And then the startup kind of like, you know, working, you know, crazy hours and, and bending all the rules and breaking some rules. And that worked out really well. And Chaotic Moon was the first startup I tried that with, and it worked out phenomenally well. Uh, and then Honest Dollar tried again, and it worked out way, way better, except set expectations grossly misset expectations for how any startup experience should ever work. Like we started it, poof, there's money. We built a thing. Goldman bought us. It's been a year. Like we, we launched it in March of 2015 at South by, we did the pitch competition and won, um, which I got a lot of shit for, but that's okay. I, I always start over like I'm starting from scratch and then, uh, and then, um, and launched the company in the next year. Uh, went on CNBC and said, we're working at Goldman. So it was, you know, that's just for all the kids out there that no startup works like that. That is a fluke. <laughs> I, I, I'll take all of the credit for, for it, but entrepreneurs are always one of two things, right? Um, but there's always two things they need and that's, you know, luck and timing, right? And so we've been really, really lucky on, on, on the timing uh, and lucky in general. Um, so no matter how smart people tell you they are, like there's a huge amount of luck involved in this game, like a tremendous amount of luck. And uh, and if you get really, really lucky, you sell the Goldman in one year, but that is never going to happen again. <laughs> so <clears throat> they, you just gave me about 55 nuggets that I want to pull out from <laughs> that just brief overview. Sure. Um, and we are going to get into the origin name of Whirly, but that's that's for a later conversation. Um, you, IBM, excuse me, Apple. Uh, excuse me, musician, Apple, IBM, and then literally bouncing back and forth from startup to Accenture, yep. from startup to Goldman, literally from idea in the head all the way through to not Fortune 500, but Fortune 50, Fortune 20 yeah. organizations. Yeah. That and that was all that was all before Chaotic Moon, right? That was like, call it 2000 through 2009. You know, I would go work at a startup and I would go work at a large company. I would go work at a startup. So, yeah, definitely bouncing back and forth for basically almost 10 years. What was a common theme of your experience during that 10 years of bouncing back and forth? Um, that everyone was wrong. Uh, <laughs> that that, that it, it, if you try to be curious and not judgmental, you know, as Walt Whitman said famously, um, and you listen to people, you, you can learn a lot. And if you uh, correlate those conversations, you can, a, a pretty clear picture can be drawn, right? Which was that, um, a great example, on the startup side, every startup founder was going to go and they were going to disembowel some incumbent in some industry of whatever. And I would always try to teach them you know, Open Office came out and there were all these articles about how it was going to destroy Microsoft. Okay. As like, okay, so Microsoft got rid of all of its products and it only sold Office and it stopped collecting revenue today. Okay. They just we can't sell another one. If they kill them, there's so much inertia in that business that would carry on for years and billions of dollars and years. And so it was this really foolish attitude that all these startups think oh, we're going to go and kill the big company. And what that led to, by the way, in the industry is now you don't see a lot of transactions over hundred million. If you see the terms of the deal weren't disclosed, it's either a really good deal that people didn't want to pay for or nine out of 10 times. It's a deal that's not, uh, term, the terms aren't released because they're not material, right? And now, and so, so that, was one, that was one thing, right? Is that there was a startup side that had all these kind of misconceptions about the effects they were going to have and all this. On the corporate side, you know, it was myopic quarter to quarter focused on the revenues and stuff. Right. And they couldn't uh, figure any of that out. So I see that uh, and I, I can completely understand on a number of different fronts with the not being able to figure it out. Um, and on the startup side, because much like you, I've had the opportunity to uh, start off with Procter and Gamble and Johnson and Johnson, two of the bluest of blue bloods. Um, and then also have had the wonderfulness of um, experiencing some uh, crazy startups, a couple of which, several of which actually, four successful exits, uh, two of which I was very involved with, two of which 
I'm not even sure I added an iota of value. It just uh, not even sure if it was there. And yet also several other uh, uh, unique startups as well that were part of it that uh, um, were ones that had to some varying degree, some crazy, crazy epic failures and learned a lot more on the failure side than I did on the actual success side. So I'm curious as to you went through your particular journey on the success and failure side. You've had some crazy, crazy, awesome success with both Chaotic Moons and with uh, with uh, Honest Dollar. But let's talk about those that you probably learned a lot more from relative to some of the uh, challenging startup failures. Well, yeah, I would say that the ones I learned the most from were going to be situations where you had, uh, the, I mean, it is the failure, right? It is the failure that you learn from, like without a doubt. And I was able to be at a couple startups, my very first one, which was called Hirestorm, uh, where we learned some valuable lessons, like don't start a startup in the beginning of the year 2000. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You know, that, that, you know, learned about, learned about market, learned about market timing and everything. And so, you know, that was a really important uh, lesson. I think there were companies like Symbia that Mike Irwin and I uh, co-founded with uh, Paco Nathan and Jamie Pugh. And, uh, you know, Frank Milano was there. He's an amazing team. Uh, but you found out that there's regulatory obstacles, right? So we had built countermeasures for the internet. And of course that upset many a government regulator and, and other people and other actors. So I think, look, there, there's nuggets of wisdom and failure. And there's this bullshit attitude with startups that failure is good. Failure is horrible. It sucks. It, it, it's, it's no good. It, it, I don't want it to be an option for my startups. And having joined other startups that other people founded, I had the benefit of a, a unique advantage that that they didn't as a founding team and that was they are stuck there i'm not right they go out of business i'm going to be i'm highly employable at that point in my career it's like i'm gonna have a job that afternoon right and so what that what that meant was that you know i took some really big risk um on on the when i picked startups to join uh things where there were um, inexperienced founders, but they had a different idea and they're really smart and they wanted to, to kind of go orthogonal to the market, right? Uh, situations where um, there wasn't money in the bank, there wasn't a lot of funding, but you know what? It seemed like a good idea. Maybe we could do it. I mean, I took a huge amount of risk. And I think that the lessons from the failures, uh, you know, the real lesson is, you know, is don't fail. There's, there's no reason for you to fail at a startup. This whole nine out of 10 startups goes out of business is, is the biggest BS pushed on, on startup founders, right? It's why entrepreneur and fortune magazine and, and uh, fast company and all these are like romance novels for startup nerds because no story that you've read on the cover. And I know many people that have been on the cover of some of those magazines, none of those stories are how I remember it happening at, at all, right? In any, in any way, shape or form. And Andrew, I know you know that because we talked about that when we met <laughs> in 2010. Um, so, you know, so look, fa failure is bad. It's horrible. And you don't have to fail. Like you can start. Okay. There's a difference between failure and meeting expectations. There's a huge difference. You as a startup founder set expectations uh, and they're probably usually insane. Like it's never gonna, and none of the stuff you think is gonna happen. And, and so when you don't reach that, you say it's a failure. And it's like, it's not. Uh, I was teaching uh, entrepreneurship, lecturing uh, at MIT and the Legatum School. And I would tell the students, um, you know, don't uh, a unicorn, that's such a stupid term. Who, who cares? Because by the time you have a unicorn, okay, uh, the management team and the founders own a very small sliver of the company, right? By the time you go public, by the time any of these things. And people read this and they're like, they went public for $2 billion. And it's like, you know, and now in tech, right, that's like a rounding error or whatever. But, but it's like, you, you have to think about this. Um, failure is what you make of it. What I mean by that is you define whether it's a failure or not, and you define whether it's failure or not on your expectation. So get better at setting expectations with yourself as a founder. Get better at saying, you know what? I've got $100,000 I've invested, and if I can sell this business for 500 grand, that's a success. 
Because I guarantee you can do that all day long or a million or two million. And what I would tell the students is go with an idea, get it built, sell it to someone, million, two million bucks. If you don't think that's not life changing, even in today's economy, even with the value of a million dollars not being what it was when I was back in my career, um, I'll drop a million dollars in anybody's bank account tonight. And I guarantee you their whole world will be turned upside down. It, it is a massive change that you cannot imagine because fuck you money is not a billion dollars it, it's whatever it takes for you to not have to have a job to sustain your lifestyle for 36 months that's there if you've got 36 months if you can pay the house payment or you don't have a house payment and you can take care of your bills and you can do whatever you want your life changes in ways you cannot possibly imagine and what i try to explain to people is that that's the secret to entrepreneurship is that I don't work for money. So kind of ironically, I get the money, right? But I'm not working for the money. That's the wrong approach to running a startup. I'm trying to get back the only resource none of us create, which is time. It's that old thing with Warren Buffett and Bill Gates getting interviewed by Charlie Rose and, yeah. you know, Bill Gates calendar is full and Warren's not and Bill Gates makes fun of him and Warren says, right, but I can make all the money I want. I can't make time. So I leave my schedule blank and then I see an opportunity. I'm like, let's go talk about it now. Let's go do this now. Right. And, and so that's why I build and, and, and run startups is to be master of my own schedule, to manufacture time, to be able to stop and do this with you and, you know, take today off to do old man doctor's appointments or whatever, right? To have that freedom because, because that's, that's freedom, right? That's freedom. And so I know that sounds like rambling off topic, but you talk about what lessons did you learn from startups? There's really three. One, failure is not a good thing. Like, like it's just not like failure is a bad thing. Two, failure is often measured by expectations that were arbitrarily yes. set by people who have no <laughs> idea what they're doing. Okay. And, and three was, if there's any reason to be working at a startup, it's so that you have time, uh, you know, for the idea, to, for your family, for whatever the thing you want time is, but that you can have freedom. The, the startup does provide you that flexibility uh, in so many ways. And everybody talks about this, you know, work until 4 a.m. Oh, I coded on it. You did not. I, I have I worked for Steve Jobs and for Stephen Mills, you know, in in, in organizations uh, that they built on very uh, stringent, very very hard work. And I will just tell you, if you work that way for about four or five days, you will be in a hospital. If you do that for two weeks, you'll be dead. So stop all this hustle culture, millennial bullshit. You worked for twenty seven hours or whatever. You you did trust me. I I, I I've been yelled at by these famous people where we'd been working for 12 or 13 and then eventually you find yourself asleep on a table tennis table. <laughs> so like, you know, come on, let's, let's bring some, let's bring, let's bring some honesty into entrepreneurship, right? You didn't make as much money on that exit as you pretended with everybody here. You didn't work that hard to get to that exit. Uh, you're really lucky. Luck and timing are the two biggest factors in any entrepreneurial endeavor. And what I found over, over, you know, my, my slight history was, I found out how to manufacture luck. And that is by being out there and exposed enough that there's this kind of energy around it. And then you put yourself in the right places at the right time. And something that you think is completely lucky, um, you know, it is random happened. I just met a very famous entrepreneur uh, on a trip that was supposed to happen this Friday, but I did it last Friday randomly, where I did an interview uh, with, a, with a woman for a conference who I had canceled three weeks ago and I was going to cancel that day. And I had forgot to bring copies of the book. I was staying with one of my investors. I forgot to bring him copies of the book. And so I ordered them on Amazon and he happened to leave for the only 30 minute time period he left was when the Amazon guy brought the stuff to his house and I was interviewing with her and I couldn't do it. And I brought the box in and the woman uh, had a guy on there that's from Austin uh, and he said, uh, oh, what tech gift, you know, gadget you get now or whatever. I said, actually, it's my new book. And I open it, I hold the book up and she falls back and goes, that's my dad's favorite book. And her dad happens to be this famous entrepreneur and he's now learning about quantum. That's the kind of luck I'm talking about, right? Like there's a, there's a randomness to entrepreneurship uh, that no one wants to, that no one wants to, uh, to admit. 
because I don't know, I guess it makes you, I guess it makes you weak if you're not imagining yourself working 800 hours a week and you're not stressed. And, you know, it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. If you, if you work, plan your work and you work your plan, you can build a startup. You can have a minor success that nobody's going to cover in the news and nobody cares about, but you could be sitting on a few million dollars and change your life and your family's life and then go do it again and do it for 10 and then go do it for a hundred, like rinse, wash and repeat. Uh, I don't know why everybody has to believe these mythical, you know, like Elon's not running 12 companies or whatever. Like, I promise you, he's not, you know, <laughs> um, you know, all, there's so much of this, this, this culture that I do kind of put on Silicon Valley that has come in that, that misleads people on the purpose of software, why you're an entrepreneur, what you should be working for, all these things. It, it really throws things off. So um, the 55 nuggets is now multiplied exponentially to like 5,550 nuggets um, that I can pull on. And Laura Webb has just uh, uh, pulled out from LinkedIn. Um, and thank you for listening in, Laura, about manufacturing luck. We're going to come back to that because I love the concept of it's the timing and the luck. However, I want to pull something from right when you had started, this, this phraseology that you used, negative wisdom. You mentioned that when you kind of started about this from a startup founder perspective and the negative wisdom that comes from um, people, and maybe it's part of setting unrealistic expectations, but I want to dig a little bit deeper. You said negative wisdom. Tell me a little bit about what you meant by that terminology, please. Well, it's, the answer is never on one side or the other. It's always somewhere in the middle. The chance of you being successful, I learned from Doug Linnett, who recently passed, God bless him. He was an amazing mentor to me. And he was once asked when he started Psych, the chances of his success. And he said, 50-50, uh, because there can be no other chance. It will happen or it won't happen, right? And so when you look at lessons like that, I've learned when you look at lessons I've learned about reaction versus response, all these little tidbits that I would lecture on when I'm talking to people about how to run their startup, the majority of those came from either a vacuum that was created or that kind of negative space, right? So think of it this way. I'm looking at a sheet of paper and on that sheet of paper is one sentence, black typewriter font, just a sentence, any sentence you want to imagine, okay? That sentence is the positive space. That's where everybody is focused, is on the words. There is a whole nother story all over every grain of the fabric of that paper that it's printed on. Is it printed on a, a special paper from the you know fancy paper store? Is it just a regular paper? Was it a, right? So that other space, all that negative space, that's where you find so many answers to startups, meaning that everybody always is afraid to look in the side at what they're screwing up or failing. And they're afraid to look in the, in the non-obvious areas. Because why? Because I got to tell my boss what I'm doing because the boss has to tell the board what they're doing because the board has to tell the investors and the funds have to tell the LPs and there's this huge chain of, and so what do we do? We find ourselves not looking for this negative space for these kind of anti lessons or whatever you, however you want to phrase it. Right. Um, because we want to go with the thing that makes us sound like we know what we're doing. We're doing a market study on go to market because that sounds right. You know, well, maybe you should just go to the mall with your product and try to sell it to five people for a hundred dollars. If nobody wants to buy it, I can save you tens of thousands of dollars of market research. <laughs> you know, like there's an obvious, there's like these obvious answers, but, but it sounds too simple or, you know what? I'm too proud as I'm not going to go to the Barton Creek mall and talk to people about, Hey, would you use my new phone app? Hey, I'd like to ask you some questions. That's stupid. That's like paying a, no, that's talking to the actual people you want to be your customer in that case. And that's the, you know, very eye opening, um, you know, but, but these lessons don't love these, the lessons are, I guess that the lessons are non obvious and, and usually unfortunately found by most people in hindsight and not, not in the time the business is running. It's found in hindsight at the time where the, the business has already collapsed. And a year later you realize, Oh, there was this thing there and you know how you realize it and it sucks for founders 
another company comes out three years later, and I know you've seen this, Andrew, we've all seen this, who's doing the same thing, but at a different time, which is a different market and slight twist. And all of a sudden that company is worth $5 billion. It's interesting because I thought of TikTok before TikTok was TikTok with a company that I had, not a company, I put together uh, an app, Sound Bites, and was exactly the same thing. And it was an idea, actually brought it. I did not, I literally did not take it to Barton Creek Mall or anywhere else and get out there, get out of the comfort zone. I was too busy with this creation of time of, and I love the concept that I think I'm going to take my Thursday and I'm going to nuke every appointment. I think there's 15 or 16 meetings on Thursday, which is insane and stupid in its own right. And I'm just going to nuke it and clear it out and say, you know what? I'm going to see what happens on Thursday. Let's just be open. Let's do the Warren Buffett thing versus the Bill Gates. I know this. I know this is, I know this, you know, I know everyone thinks I'm crazy anyway, so who cares? But, but it's almost like a meditative thing. Like think about Einstein, think about what I'm doing now, quantum computing, think about the physicist, think about what was Einstein, these thought experiments, right? Basically just sitting around dreaming stuff up, thinking about like, but you have a direction, right? You have an idea of something you're thinking about. That would do most startups so much better than trying to come up with a business plan or a forecast on a model. Like, listen, everybody, when you send me your forecast as an entrepreneur, as, as a entrepreneur slash investor, I already know it's 100% bullshit, right? There is no way any of that. And there has never been one forecast in one pitch meeting that has ever been met ever in, in history. Uh, you know, uh, there's been a few that have been better, but they've been so much better. The forecast was grossly underrepresented what, what would happen, right? So, so you know, I just think we need this, you know, there needs to be honesty. You know, these, the, what kills startups is, and it took me forever to learn this because I'm 52 now and I'm, I'm starting to learn this, which is patience is a lack of patience. This move move fast and break things isn't a, a, a good thing. And when you were breaking old industries, it kind of worked out. Now everything's digital, so you could be breaking like all kind of stuff, right? Like, you know, medical equipment, you know, software companies, you don't want them moving fast and breaking things. You know, what about the your bank? You know, so no, please don't move fast. You know, I use, I won't mention them because they, they would probably hate this, but I use a very nice bank that I love because they don't have a lot of fancy technology. And when I first went in there, I swear to God, we had so much money in these banks. And if we asked for a car loan, they'd have been like, too risky. I was like, I'm putting all my money with these guys. <laughs> no one no one can hack in. There's basically like, I feel it's the first banking relationship I have where I feel 100% safe. <laughs> but but no, it's seriously, it's like, but think about it. What is What have we done? We've we've misinformed and disillusioned two or three generations of entrepreneurs with all of this Silicon Valley, you know, move fast, break things, hustle culture, this, that, whatever, social media influencer BS. Like they're never going to be successful. As far as, you know, you know, their Instagram says they are killing it. I've seen them in three private. Well, I haven't seen them in the private jets. I've seen them around three private jets and two the best hits. This, yep. this week. Yeah, yeah, yep. right? The best hits of everyone, and it, it, it's fascinating that you mentioned that on several different fronts because whether it is the influencer, whether it's through social media, whether it's through whatever mechanism that people are getting out, and the the beautiful thing about social media is everybody has a voice. The terrible thing about social media is everybody has a voice. And in some cases, the loudest voices seem to get heard more and more frequently. And the culture, the, the, the technology is pointing towards whatever gets the most clicks, whatever gets the most attention, whatever gets the most boost associated with what that is. And frustrating Absolutely. in some cases, it's frustrating for me. And I want to, I want to switch off on this because I want, I'm, my brain is fried right now because I want to go in 15 different directions with you. And I'm trying to figure out which one to go. The one thing that I think makes the most, um, the most interesting piece associated with this is this concept of manufacturing luck. I'm going to go back to Laura's comment. Um, I'm a huge sure. fan of the right people at the right time at the right place. So those three things coming together. 
the times that I've had the best success, both business and frankly, personally, have been associated with those where right people, right time, right place. I also am a fan of this concept of the more you get out of your comfort zone, when you're talking about yes. literally going out there, that's where 90 plus percent of your learning, your impact actually happens. Oh, yeah. Comments or thoughts on that with right people, right place, right time with the manufacturing luck analogy. I'm going to come back to the right people, right place, right time. Okay. Dig into that a little deeper, but a quick short rant, which is what I feel like I'm doing. Sorry, I do on what you just said uh, about, um, you know, you talked about, you know, your three, three things, right? You get the right people, the right place at the right time. So I, I think there's, there's more than that. Uh, but then when you, when you speak about, you know, okay. Um, I, I guess, I guess this is the thing is you're going to see a lot more manufacturing of luck, but you made a comment that I wanted to comment on. And that was that, that comfort zone. Listen, when you go and you ask somebody about your product and you think you're just so damn smart uh, and, and they, you know, your mom tells you, well, that doesn't, I wouldn't do that, blah, 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 or whatever. And you're like, she doesn't know anything about iPhones or whatever. You've, that's where you, that's where most entrepreneurs screw up. I want all the criticism, heap it on me. I want every stupid idea because out of a thousand of them, there's a hundred nuggets as you can call up to an interview. Right. Like I want to know what somebody who has no idea thinks, because if I can make that person fall in love with my product, if I can make that person be empowered to do something or whatever, that's where the success is. Right. Lift drivers and savings accounts with honest dollar. Right. Build in the mobile apps at the right timing where you came in, whatever. It all comes down to that. But I would add a couple of criteria. So right time, right. You know, right people, right time, right place is awesome, uh, but also needs the right idea and the right support because none of us can grow a company alone. That's not just familiar support. That's like the right investor support, right? And the right investor support to me is probably usually not a venture capitalist, right? Um, there, there is, there is no venture anymore. It's really growth. And the thing entrepreneurs forget is that, you know, venture capitalists have a product and that's you, you are their product. They take your decks. They don't sign NDAs. So when they go to the teacher's retirement fund of whatever state or country or sovereign fund, and they say, uh, we have heard a lot about Bitcoin and quantum. They go, look at all the deal flow we have. You should give us a billion dollars. And, and by the way, and then they never call you and say, we'll write you that $10 million check now. And that's because, unfortunately, VCs lie all the time. And I, I, I got a lot of good ones in Strangeworks, and I love them. But but the majority, you know, they're rare, right? They're very rare. Um, Ray Lane's one of our investors, very famous guy in history. I love that guy. He tells you exactly what it is. Like, yes, I'll do that. No, I won't do that. I hate that. I love that. Most venture capitalists, uh, you know, especially when you're in the pitch phase, they tell you what you, you know, they're like, they don't say no, right? They say not now, and, and it's usually <laughs> and it's usually show me your and insert the appropriate. It's almost like a can set of responses. I Two million dollars in ARR. <laughs> yes, where's your where's your lighthouse customer? Where's your ARR? Uh, I we need market validation that somebody else is doing this versus you being the first one to actually break that component or whatever else might be associated with it. All of, I've been through um, been through the series A, B, C, D rounds of funding back in the day. Did the West Coast and East Coast Look, uh, all the we, way across with got, the VCs. We got out of it, and, and, and I, I, it. I lost a portion. I lost a portion of my soul pitching repeatedly to all different types of folks associated with that. Um, and we've actually this is a perfect timing, and I know you and I are both seeing this at the same time. Michael's asking a question about how to I replicate. See that. And yeah. I, I was going to, let's yeah, talk so, about that. So, so Michael, you look, you can do that. Um, you can form your own user groups out of those niche forums. You can incentivize people for feedback. I don't ever really do that. Um, but there's tons of, of way to get, to get feedbacks on, on games. Um, you know, the problem with feedback on games is I find game developers be really secretive. It's a very competitive market. And so the problem with doing, with replicating that isn't how do you repeat Barton Creek? It's like, how do you give enough away to get the feedback without giving too much away that somebody else might, might hear about it 
because of those niche forums you're saying, uh, which, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, but uh, do you have a, Michael, and you can just type in the window, do you have a, 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 t a market for the game? Is there an age range? Is it an educational game? Is it a console or, a, you know, you say, I think you said PC. Yeah, so you need a PC. Can it run? Can it run? Can it run? Can it run, can it run on a laptop, Michael? Because if so, you can take that laptop to Park Green Mall. <laughs> security, <laughs> security, security will ask you not to do that, but is, you can you can get away with that. Um, no, I mean it, it, could, it could be hard to replicate in some situations, but I find it's 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 often very easy. And look, you want to go for the broadest market as possible. You want your mom to buy that game, your grandma to buy that game, just like you do the most rabid gamer. You want the the you know sports star that you think could tweet about it to, to want that game. You want everybody to want it. I think this is the problem: is we built these formulaic approaches to startups that lead us to define go to market as this. Here is our target persona, and here is our you know down and down and down. It becomes mechanical, and in becoming mechanical. Your target persona, of course they love your idea. They do that all the time. You're like, we're going to work with data scientists and we're going to do a thing that's a pain for data scientists. And here's the good news. That's great. And it's a great way to start a business and you'll have a successful business. But the big hit businesses aren't, aren't those businesses. The big hit businesses are Jobs and Wozniak saying everybody should have a PC or, you know, uh, you know, even Gates or, you know, name, name. Those are the big things. It's never something where you're like, you know, you defined a market, uh, you know, and you defined a persona and you find, you narrowed it down and down and down. I love hearing what people who have no, I talk to more people at quantum computing in the airport where I have a whole shtick. I have my book and I take out like three of them and I sign them because of where I'm going to. And somebody always asks that about that. And then you have this conversation with somebody who knows nothing and it makes you better at pitching it makes you more understanding of how the, the outside larger world sees your idea and your task is just hugely beneficial. But people don't want to because they're like, that person cleans airplanes. They're an idiot. What could they possibly know? So, and it's like, you know what they know? They know they could spend money on your product. So you want to know what they think. The real world feedback is something that is incredible and incredibly important. And I want to, I'm going to use that as a bounce to a different I'm going to take, take a step back relative to a concept from a more macro perspective. In 1991, early, you were a recovering musician that was literally taking a job doing phone support, literally telephone support. I loved, I loved, that, I loved that job, though. So, I loved that job. <laughs> so, so 1991, you're on the phone doing phone support for Apple. 2023... You're writing a book, quantum computing for babies, and now quantum computing for dummies. Phone support, Apple, quantum computing for dummies. These are two entirely not connected topics, yet they are with technology where you were using telephones to communicate back 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And now in 2023, we're talking quantum computing and trying to make that become for the masses. It's Walk okay. me through the path. It's, I want to walk you through the path from a there, technology there is, perspective. There is, there is no path. That's the, that's the thing. They're the same thing. Every startup I've done is the exact same thing, which is realizing that people are the prize and people are the problem. People are the prize in these mass markets where they're buying your product and doing whatever. That's your goal, right? You want to change their lives, hopefully, with your product. is about more than just making money. And people are the problem at your startup because the more of them you have, the more these little telephone games happen. The more that so, – so you say, okay, phone support to quantum computing. Think about what I'm doing. What did I do on the phone? I had no way of uh, looking at your screen. They didn't have that. The internet was brand new. So what am I doing? I am taking a concept and I'm trying to simply explain it to you, Andrew, using voice only over the phone that your problem with your computer, I have no idea. I'm like, okay, go to the Apple menu, do this. Okay, now you should see that. Now what about the, I'm 
guessing what you're cooking. How many guess? I had a woman once yell at me because she couldn't print a resume. And she said, it said in the menu, resume printing. I was on the phone with this woman for two hours and I got famously fired and then hired back because I was really good at the phone support. Uh, but I was, she was like, this is for this doctor and it's for the president. He's the most important person and I'm trying to help her and it's not working. And she says, look, if I click on that damn menu, it says right at the bottom, resume printing. And I was like, that says resume printing. <laughs> I've been on the phone with you for hours. I've been on the phone for like two and a half hours. <laughs> that is an absolutely classic. It's where the emphasis, where, where, the, where the emphasis goes. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Language, you know, words have meanings, people. Words have meanings. Uh, but, but, but here's the thing. So, so here's the thing. What am I doing now? I'm taking this really complex concept. I'm trying to simplify it. I started with the baby's book on purpose. I went to the dummy's book on purpose. I'm trying to help educate people on one of the biggest technological changes in the history of our species. And nobody has any idea. Forget security. I mean, it, global balance of power, world changing, everything you can imagine, okay? It's all, everything you know is at an end. This is the first step away from the von Neumann architectures we've used in computing for the entire history of computing. This is the first step away from the transistor as a basis for computing. We now have an electron, right? That we spin with lasers or cool down or whatever. So this is a huge change. And so, you know, to me, there's no delta between answering phone support at Apple and running Strangeworks other than this. Here, other people were responsible for the financing. Now I am. <laughs> Here, other people did the hiring and firing. Now I am, with the exception of some, some basic things. It's the same job, which is to take a technology and explain it in a way and make it accessible in a way such that it is democratized among as many people as possible. And that could be printing resumes on a Quadra 700, or it could be learning how to program Kizkit uh, to, to do work on a quantum computer. There's no delta. And I think that's the problem is we all try to make our technology and our startup is so special, you know? And, and by the way, it's always going good. And so one tidbit, because I know we're going to run short on time in a few minutes. One tidbit I, I always get out is my fellow entrepreneurs, when you tell me how great your startup is going, I know that you're lying to yourself or to me or both of us, okay? Because I've done this a lot and there's never been one time ever in the history of the world that that has happened. Not once. <laughs> it's never, we had a great idea and people gave us money and the people bought it. Now we're rich, IPO. Like, it's just like you're crazy. And that goes back to that setting expectations, right? So expectation setting, I'm going, to, I'm going to circle back around as well, because we've talked a little bit, we've talked a lot on so many different topics. However, there's been one common theme of this technology that's permeated throughout. However, you've brought us back several times to the importance of validating the idea, validating the assumptions, the forecasting, which are 100% going to be BS across the board. However, selling to somebody the people aspect of things. I want to come back to the human side of the equation. How have you seen from 91 talking to resume or resume printing lady all the way now to 2023, which that's going to be just an absolute classic story. Now we're looking at 2023 where we're looking at artificial intelligence. We've got blockchain, we've got crypto, we've got AI, we've got AGI, we've got the, the quantum, which now has become something that people have talked about on the fringes to now more mainstream. Where have you seen the people, the human souls part of this, be consistent or changed over the course of the last several decades? Well, look, um, it, it's not all change in a bad way. I mean, the biggest change in the last several decades is that we spent the last 20 years investing in social media, right? Investing in this this ego fest where, I mean, I get in arguments with you all the time where I'm like, oh, that's amazing. But like, I know that's not true, right? Like that guy is sleeping on my couch right now. And they're like, he's in a jet. <laughs> it's on Instagram. You know, <laughs> you're just like. 
You, you ain't right. all that is what I'm hearing. <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, look, it's been a negative technology. What world are we raising our kids in where that, you know, I mean, I love the influencer photo. Have you ever seen, there's this guy doing these brilliant YouTube videos where he shows the influencers video and then he shows the real one. And it's got that little sound where it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, here's what they showed you filmed on a red camera at the perfect sunset with a fog machine or whatever and they're like here it is like it's gross <laughs> you know or they're all going and jumping in those lakes in siberia or whatever that are literally toxic yeah and like they have died and it's like yeah here's the deal if your lake is bright blue and fluorescent green like maybe don't go in it <laughs> like, i don't know it's not it's not beautiful it's deadly <laughs> but um but no so i've seen a lot of negatives honestly with the technology and that's part of what i'm hoping to change with strange works i'm hoping to bring more people in the conversation more people in the in the in the guiding where these technologies like quantum and ai go and, and more people that are informed in the decisions they make with what, with what they use um there been, look, there've been a ton of positive things. I can run the entire company from a device that fits in my pocket. That's phenomenal. Like there's, it's not like there's great, but that's not a societal change, right? That, that's not, that, that doesn't, that's not change. You know, I've seen mostly, I think these a negative outcome, look at what has happened to the news media, right? Because of social media, all of the ad dollars ended up being clicks. So you put more bodacious things out to get the clicks that now permeated all the way down through to the news media. It should be no surprise that the medias are all biased. I don't care what side of what fence you're on. They're all entertainment because look at the titles, go into Google news right now, go into whatever Apple news, whatever app you use and look at the news stories. And it won't be like, Oh, a thing happened like who, what, when, where, how, and why it'll be this insanity of like, this person accuses the other with the death of the thing. And the titles are so sensationalist and the article, and you read them and nothing's in the article, right? Like that, that has been the negative impact of technology is everybody can have a podium. Some, some people shouldn't, sorry. It's just, it's, that's the truth. Nobody wants to say that, but it's real. Um, everybody can have an opinion, right? That they can spout on that podium. Everybody has followers. Everybody is an important influential superstar which means nobody is an important influential superstar right because if 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 everybody's special then nobody's special i mean that's been the biggest and i hate to harp on that because i'd love to i'd love to tell you about the technologies that you know dean came and brought uh to help save people's lives or the the work that's been done in neuroscience there's been tons of great societal impacts um for small marginalized groups. Like if you had a certain cancer 10 years ago, uh, my mom just had, she took a little pill. She didn't have chemo, she didn't have anything. She's, she's great. That's a miracle of technology, right? But when we talk technology, we usually talk about the digital stuff, right? We're not talking about all of these energy or medical or whatever. And we talk about that, it has been dominated, unbelievably dominated by social media or social media like things. You know, until the advent of open AI, I can't think of one other company or tech that wasn't just social media or dependent upon social media or, you know, it, it's, it's sad, but now you're seeing investors move into a trend of investing in deep tech, chaotic moon, open AI, i uh, sorry, strange works, open AI, things like this, you know, that's a, uh, I let something slip there that you should mark this time and come back to you in about four months. But I'm just going to say that so that nobody thinks it's bullshit later when I say it. But, but anyway, but that that's that's a trend that's really, I think, going to change. Now people are looking at energy. They are looking at the environment. They are looking at medical tech. They are looking at. And so I think this is the best change in technology. And now we'll see a positive societal impact uh, as we move forward. But the last 20 years have been dominated with social media. And, and media and things like that. And it's turned into a cesspool. It's not great for society. It, we've had numerous conversations on that with almost every one of our guests about the challenges, uh, the benefits and the challenges associated with that. I wanna take, we've got only a few minutes left and I have two questions. Um, uh, one of which is the simple one. Um, and the one of which is the uh, interesting one. The, the simple question is the, the, the live cast is humanizing software, but the subtitle is people driven tech. Three words. 
I've asked right. every one of our previous guests what they mean to them. In your in your mind, or like when we say people driven tech, what immediately resonates with you? Uh, that that the people that are the users of the technology, uh, you know, basically first principles, open source principles, that the people using the technology have full access to technology, that they are involved in the direction of technology, in the development of it, right? That there's an ODA feedback loop, right? That you're not building something in a vacuum that's like, oh, we built a cool app because we could, but we haven't talked to anybody at the mall, right? We haven't had any opinions. We don't have any user, you know, groups. Now, I did work in an organization famously created by a man who said the customer doesn't know anything. It was a very, very big, very big Henry Ford fan, right? It was like, if, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they just said they want a faster horse, right? So, yeah, yeah. so, 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 you know, I'm saying that out of one side of my mouth, but, but here's the thing. I do disregard a disproportionate amount of the stuff I hear from talking to all those random people. It's the one that makes it through the filter that becomes life-changing for me and for my company and for my employees. It's the one person who asks a question a certain way or doesn't get the explanation, so I have to come up with a new thing on the spot or whatever. Those moments are worth a thousand other conversations that go nowhere that are opinions that I give some credence to, but I'm like, you know, at the end of the day, I don't really care, right? Uh, so it's not all customers you listen to and it's very hard to find those customers that have those jewels, those insights. And you have to face it. They may not be customers. They could just be people. Just be people, not just customers. I love the concept on that. Um, and thank you for your perspective. Uh, there's several things that I want to come back to, but that's going to be for a separate time, separate way down the road. Origin story of Whirly. I had to ask. We're going to keep it. We're going we're gonna to keep it short. The reason I jumped right to that was not that I like it or have some big ego about it is because that is the number one question all the time is, why do you call yourself that? And the answer is, I don't. Other people did. And we will out this. One of them was my former business partner, Mike Irwin, who passed away this year, unfortunately, earlier. And the other one was my good friend of 30 years, Sebastian Hassinger, who both worked at Apple with me when I got moved up into the direct response center and the train, which was all the cool people were, and they, my cube opened to the thing and they would go get coffee and I'd be like, Hey guys, how's it going? And it's like, Pfft, and totally disregarded me. And in at Apple, they had a system called radar and you got a username, nothing in Apple could be changed or deleted. Once it was in there, it was in there forever. And they called me W Hurley, like Whirly. And they told my manager that that was it. Sebastian coined the term like crazy guy. He'll tell you a slightly different version of the story. We're old. They're, they're, there's there's ninety percent of both of them are true, but I'm sure we're fluffing on some details. We're we're we're. I mean, I have an ARP card on my phone, so you know whatever. But but like um, that's where it came from. And then I used to I used to tell people don't call me that. And then it kind of stuck. And then it stuck in the open source community. And then it stuck with a project. And then in 2006, there were two inflection points. 2006, I got hired to be the, the head of a, a CTO of a startup in Tel Aviv. And they requested that I do that. I was reading through the docs at what they were going to pay me and all. And I flipped through and I said, uh, I said, you know, what you don't understand is it's actually you know, this guy, Sebastian, love him to death, but he, he wasn't being nice when he said that. And I was like, but a personal brand seems like something I can definitely check into as I look at the numbers on the sheet of paper. And then uh, I hosted President Obama in 2016 at South by. And he said, uh, I want to thank Worley, 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 Worley. And then my mother in law now calls me Worley. But for the record, I have no ego or investment that you can call me Worley or Will or William. Don't call me Billy. That's what my mom calls me. And you can't call me Bill because that's my dad's name and he gets really upset. There's not two Bills. Outside of that, I don't really care. You call me dude or whatever, but that's how that came into being. And I think the, the irony is that now Sebastian and I often laugh about now that he created that because he kind of, I don't want to say hates it, but he's kind of like, ugh, it's a whirly thing. He'll be like, that's a whirly thing. And it's like, well, you made it. <laughs> so, so he has to live with that. So thank you, Whirly. And I know that I think I may have made the mistake of calling you William before. And I caught you myself. You can call me William. And, I've, and I know I've said, dude, I know I've said a whole bunch of different things. But Whirly, 
as we wrap up today, I just want to thank you a ton. I know you've got the book back behind well, you. Thanks for computing. having me. Absolutely. Um, I'm interested and we're going to connect up with your world travels at some point. And I'm going to, we're going to sit down over coffee and talk about that book. And I'm going to get a signature so, on it from you. On so that. if you, if you, are you in Austin right now? I'm heading downtown here in just about five minutes. That's, that's what I thought. So here's the deal. Tonight at Trifecta, Jay Bussois, who I think you also know, uh, who is a new owner in Trifecta, is hosting a quantum computing something or other he's got me going into. And I'm bringing a few copies of the book. And if you would like to show up, Andrew, if you can, I will sign and give you a copy tonight. And then Jay will only have six copies to give away instead of the seven. But I'm totally fine. I'm totally fine doing that to him for you. <laughs> That's awesome. That is fantastic. Orly, thank you again for joining. We're going to wrap up. And I want to tell everybody that's listening in, the conversation does not stop here. We are so blessed to have who we've had on the call today with Worley, with his background, his perspective, and yet this conversation lives on. Visit our website at tailwindsw.com. Join the Humanizing Software channel. Participate. Participate, please engage with us as we continue this conversation of keeping the human side of the equation involved with what we're doing. And as we sign off for today, we want to wish everybody that's listening here and abroad a very, very good morning, a good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks so much for joining us.